This week, Mike Simon from Kryptonite joins us for our feature interview for the show. In our startup articles and discussion, the 10x rule for social marketing strategies for uh, startups, actually, which apply to, to other things other than startups. Just finish it. Uh, pivotal survival tactics. Six reasons your small business will fail and how to avoid them. Uh, in the startup and security notes of interest, K2 Intelligence McAfee and GFI makes an acquisition. Michael and I will talk about our startup journeys. And in my own startup, we're kind of uh, approaching coming uh, out of stealth mode. Uh, we kind of dipped into stealth mode. We're coming out of it. So I actually have some really, really great updates for our audience, uh, as well as Michael does as well. So all that and more on this edition of Startup Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly for security professionals by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show about security startups, how to secure your startup, and advice for security startups, it's Startup Security Weekly. I need it from the top. Brought to you by... Gain control of cyber risk with Tenable IO, the first vulnerability management platform built for today's elastic assets like cloud, containers, and web apps. Discover a fresh asset-based approach that prioritizes vulnerabilities while seamlessly integrating into your environment. And improve ROI with the first elastic licensing approach based on assets, not IP addresses. Tenable IO delivers the data and context you need to secure your elastic attack surface. Start your free Tenable IO trial today by visiting tenable.io. Ooh, welcome everyone to Startup Security Weekly. This is episode 37. It's April 28th, 2017, and it is Friday, and I'm reporting to you live from our lovely studios that we call G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island. On the lines uh, via Skype from the beach, soon to be not the beach, I'm told, so I don't <laughs> know, we're not going to be able to call him the beach bum anymore. It's Michael Santarcangelo. Michael, welcome to the show. It's always good to be here, and I'm still barefoot, and I'm Pretty sure that'll happen when we move. Yes. I don't think I'm going to develop a lot. We're going to stay. We're going to stay south. We're going to stay warm. We're going to a bigger city. Uh, more details this summer, but we're we're prepping. Awesome. I guess this is probably the first I've talked about it publicly. Yes, we are. We are preparing to vector away from the beach. Well, that's good. Change is good. I used to have a, work really for good. someone that used to say embrace change. Embrace change. Embrace change. I've talked about yes. it on the show before. Um, yeah, no, it's it's good. It'll be really good. It's good for business. It's it's good for everything. A uh, quick announcement, ITPro.tv's courses now include ITIL Managing the Lifecycle and Microsoft Hello for Business. Premium annual memberships include all video content as well as access to virtual labs and Q&A forums. You'd pay normally $85.70 a month or $857 per year, but we've got a special limited time offer for our listeners. Get 50% off. The monthly membership for the lifetime of your active subscription. Go to itpro.tv forward slash startup security. Use the code SS50. And that code, I'm told, is ending somewhat soon. Uh, it will be extended uh, for a little while, but make sure you take advantage of that because uh, they have awesome training on itpro.tv. Michael, why don't you introduce our featured guest for today? Yeah, this is going to be fun. So uh, we've got Mike Simon joining us from Kryptonite. And uh, Mike, I actually, before you joined us, I, I got to watch some of the video that you've done recently. So I, I've got a little bit of the background of the history of it, but you're doing something I think is really kind of interesting. And so I, I'm excited to talk to you both about what it's like running a startup that was sprung from something bigger, as well as some of the challenges that we're facing in looking at, uh, at the way this all goes. So joining us is Mike Simon, and we're going to talk a little bit about how to better defend our networks. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Appreciate it. So I guess if, if you don't mind, give us kind of the overview. And since I've already set it up for the way that you guys spun out, your pathway to, to being a startup and to solving some of these problems, I think is a little different than others. So I guess tell us a little bit about what Kryptonite does, high level. We'll get into the details. And then tell us a little bit about what that journey was like to being spun off and, and how that's worked out so far. Sure. No problem at all. So Kryptonite is, uh, I would classify us as a disruptive technology. We're, uh, we're an appliance-based solution that sits in line in the network. And our role is to really reduce attack surface. 
If you do two things, reduce attack surface, and the second thing is you disrupt reconnaissance and other tactics to gain information, you're really doing a phenomenal job of limiting attacks in an enterprise, and that's what we do. As far as the journey, uh, it's quite interesting. Um, back in 2010, our parent company started taking contracts with the federal government to do research and development into moving target defense. I was brought in in 2015 to spin the company out of the defense contractor, raise capital, and start to build a company. And it's, it's like I said, it's been a fun ride ever since. So when you guys spun out, you still had to raise capital? It wasn't like a wholly owned subsidiary spin out? It was a take this and go forth, but you know, you got to do it on your own? You know, it's a great question. And one of the things that I sort of uh, made happen early on is that the startup would wholly own the technology, but wouldn't be controlled by some other company. And that was important for bringing in outside capital, partners, and owning the IP in its entirety. So then we had to go out and raise capital, brought in some great investors, uh, built a product, and now we have uh, com- customers at this point. So if, if we can stand that for a minute, just because th- this is fascinating stuff to a lot of people who listen to our program. So so you had uh, IP established at the time. Did you, so when you went out to raise capitals, capital, did you already have um, customers or traction or proof of concept? Or uh, you know, I'm just kind of curious what some of that early stage stuff was like. Yeah, when it was spun out of the uh, parent company, there was, uh, you know, base technology. I would call it more in the R and D mode. Okay. Uh, not customers as of yet, but certainly proof that the technology could protect from the things I've just talked about. Um, once we spun the company out, uh, raised the capital, we then had to turn the R and D into commercial product, and that took some time. So, so Mike, when you described what the product was doing, uh, it sounded like you provide a uh, reducing your attack surface and uh, also some deception technologies. Did you are you in like a newer market? Do you put yourself in a particular vertical within security, or are you creating a newer uh, kind of thing? I think you described it fairly well. We have a deception component. We have a segmentation component. But the key differentiation between us and other players is we're in line with all traffic. We're not sitting off to the side. We're not oh, trying to create. We're not. We're not trying to create a honeypot to direct people to a different direction. We are always on and always stopping the tactics that lead to insider threat, that lead to mounting and executed attacks. So we are always on twenty four seven. So as a startup, when you went to organizations and said, hey, for our technology to benefit you, we need to be in line. When I make that pitch to companies, there's often met with a lot of hesitation and a lot of skepticism about being in line because you have the uh, capability to perhaps affect performance, uptime, integrity. Uh, How do you overcome some of those challenges as a startup? You know, it's once again a, a solid question. We get that question all the time. The way you, you mitigate that risk or address it is you hire phenomenal talent that has years and years of expertise of how to you know, reduce uh, latency, how to build an appliance that is just as fast as an access switch um, so that you're dealing with you know, a 50 microsecond hop, not a hop in a seconds. So we build a technology that does not delay a network whatsoever. So are you building it into the chip, I mean, because you're a device, or are you able to achieve that now at almost line speed, but still pull it off and, and process on top of it? Uh, the latter. So we, we're not into wow. the ch- chip, but we have you know very high power processing elements as part of this. Um, and we, you know, we do a lot of processing um, in parallel to achieve this. Um, and we still have a lot, a, lot of, a lot of bandwidth left over to do additional work. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting, and, and I'll back that up, Mike, because in my research lately, uh, with in terms of processor technologies and in hardware and software interactions, when I speak with people now, they're like, you know, the processors that come on systems today are so fast, that 
for many applications, you don't need any more coprocessors because the Intel chips that are coming out are just so fast in so many cores. And in fact, you could add the cores here. Yeah. yeah, well, in in, in it, it, you don't even need that many cores anymore. Like certain applications I was looking at are like, yeah, like beyond six cores really doesn't impact performance. So just get six cores, make them as fast as possible, and you don't even need to offload that. And I've seen that in a number of different applications. So um, I'm about, I'll back you up there, Mike. Oh, absolutely. I would totally agree. All right. So then go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, I, I was just going to ask about the cloud aspect, right? And uh, we speak to a lot of startups and a lot of vendors in security, and the, the cloud question always comes up. I get the question all the time, you know, does your stuff work in the cloud? And, you know, some customers are like, I don't want to play in the cloud. But more and more customers are, hey, I like your solution, but I've got a huge Amazon AWS deployment or I've got a huge deployment in Azure or we're moving in that direction. How do you uh, address that issue? Yeah, we, we do address it. And the, we address it probably a little differently than most other players. Think of a cloud application and someone's enterprise accessing that cloud application. How do I validate that that user who, who is who they say they are? How do I know that they haven't been spoofed? How do I know that they aren't going to steal the assets in the cloud domain that they're accessing? So what we provide is we provide an integration to the cloud, an API, if you will, to pass the information that says the person that's accessing this information is a valid user, they've been authenticated, uh, they haven't stolen information, and they're ready to access this information and draw it down from the cloud. So we don't reside in the cloud, but we integrate to the cloud. And so I, I like that, though, because it speaks to reducing your attack surface. And there's kind of this new class or a category that a lot of people play in that basically helps you validate what traffic and behavior is good so that you don't have to analyze all of the other cruft that's happening on your network. Mm -hmm. um, I think, I don't, Michael, I don't think you, were, you weren't there for the distill networks, right? But they can tell you from a web browser perspective, is that a real user or is it some kind of automated technology? And it sounds like your product is doing something similar sitting on the network, basically allowing the IT team to say, hey, I can identify like real users versus all of the other stuff. And it speaks to my thing that I really like, like you help make other products better by doing that. Is that one of the things that you have in your, your value proposition? A absolutely. And I, I, I want to caveat my prior statement to say not everything is finished in our integration to the cloud. Mm -hmm. Some of this is where we're headed. But, um, you know, we're, we're a piece of a much bigger puzzle. Um, products that try to say that they're the end all to fight <laughs> cyber issues mm. are, are, are dead on arrival. So our role is how do we take wireless users, how do we take wired users, how do we authenticate them into networks, how do we let them access information without, without having hackers be able to figure out, you know, what is the network topology within that enterprise, whether they came from a wireless or wired environment, and then going to the cloud, how do you have them um, securely and effectively access cloud services without spoofing the cloud services and stealing information. So we fit in that whole domain between wireless and the cloud. So is it, uh, well, you talked about uh, segmentation as well. Are you uh, kind of delving into the, well, they don't like to be called NAC vendors anymore, right? But <laughs> when, when we look at the, the problems that we have in security, you know, and we talk about how segmentation is very important, it's all about validating what assets you have. Are they bad? Are they good? And hey, if they're bad, put them over here. If they're good, put them over here. If something good becomes bad, we'll put them over in the bad. How do you help uh, that process? Um, I think the, the best way to describe it is that when you're in line with the whole process, you have the ability to determine um, where, where are users able to go within a network. Uh, at a very fine grain level. We're talking about a packet level. So you're able to say, well, this endpoint can't set up a, a command and control channel back to a hacker. So you can, you can free up that endpoint from that communication. Um, you can go ahead and determine um, if you're integrating to the cloud service or a, a VM or NSX, let me go ahead and look at how to import the policy of what's in the cloud into into the endpoint architecture we're not quite there yet but that's where we fit between 
the endpoint segmentation and the cloud segmentation and making the determination of where a user can go in a network, what is permitted, what is not permitted. And if they go outside of those permissions, how do we report that in real time so you're not looking at investigating a breach after the fact, you're looking at investigating while someone's trying to access information. Yeah, and you said before, Mike, that you're kind of, um, you know, no one has all of the answers, and I, I completely agree with that. I think there's a lot of, some vendors that, like, pitch that, like, come to us for everything kind of thing. But in that light, as a startup, how, it, being a piece of the puzzle, how do you figure out which integrations that you want to have? Like, what's your strategy for integrations? And advice for other startups when they start thinking about how do I integrate with the rest of the ecosystem in security and IT? Um, the best way to answer that question is go out and talk to people. Mm. You know, talk to enterprises, not just small little companies, but talk to you know Fortune 2500 companies. They're willing to talk to startups. Yeah. They're willing to give advice. Ask them what are they using? What are they using for a layer seven inspection tool? Obviously, lots of people are using Palo Alto. What are they using for Sims? Obviously, Splunk um, is an important product in the Sim architecture. Uh, what are they using for wireless secure protection? Uh, Aruba Network seems to be a very popular product there. So then you have to figure out how do you integrate from an API perspective? How do you integrate from a use case perspective and how they use that those products in their enterprise? And that's what we focus on. We focus on the use cases to, pro to protect people from um, security breaches. Mm -hmm. Um, Michael, more questions for, for Mike? Well, yeah, I, I, so I, I, I like this idea of reducing the attack surface, and I'm, I'm looking at the website, too, um, which is nice. I mean, like, I, I like the way that things are explained on it. So you're in line, and you're, you're basically preventing or obfuscating uh, a potential attacker's ability to do recon on your, on your network and all that lateral movement and stuff. Um, wh without giving anything away, like, how, how do you do that when you're in line and not disrupt what legitimate traffic and legitimate people need to do? How do you sort those two out on the fly? Well, the way you do that is you support standard protocols, you support sta you know standard communication between endpoints, access switches, core switches in the network, and uh, you let all, and you let legitimate actions occur. I got um, it, yep. Good. No, I was gonna say. I mean, these are some things we've we've talked about before. So, do you then find yourself uh, running into situations where you almost have to help the client level up a little bit and say, "Okay, you're probably not going to tell them their baby's ugly, but you got to point out you guys are a little sloppy here and a little sloppy here and well, really sloppy here." Do you have to end up helping them tighten up a little bit so that they can be as effective as they want? Uh, a long answer is absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just I, I I was just thinking about that uh, as how that starts to kind of into play. If you could, then so I'm looking at it. So you got kind of the three parts. Um, you start by concealing the topology, and then you get into what you call the micro shield, which is a little bit what I think Paul was just talking about. Uh, if you could for a second. So the auto defend. So it, it, and I think this is interesting because this is something that we talk a lot about on this program and across the security uh, weekly uh, network. The attacks they get executed quickly. They they can lurk for a long time. And so you're looking at being able to kind of figure that out as as it's happening. And I think you just alluded that to that a minute ago. Um, can you just explain that a little bit better? Because I'm I'm intrigued by that. Well, I think that you have to start with the building blocks, right? What are the building blocks that hackers use? Um, and there are uh, groups of tactics they use to spoof, laterally move. They are constantly doing recon to gain actionable information to mount and execute attacks. So the objective should be in security. How do I get rid of those, those building blocks as mechanisms that a hacker can use to plan and execute an attack? So we, we basically remove these categories of these tactics on a network. And that, that's how we approach security. So then, you know, as I'm looking at it too, uh, and it, I feel, you know, Paul, I feel bad if we don't ask people about this. Are you then doing any sort of analysis like, you know, UBA or other sort of learning at some point to start to recognize patterns of traffic? Or are you really just able to operate at more of a, whitelisted kind of approach to say this is what's expected if it deviates we flare up 
we're much more of a whitelist. We're we're an always on whitelisted approach that allows legitimate traffic through. We depend on others to um, potentially throw out a span port or a, a, a full sanitized view of our network to do a deep packet inspection analysis of legitimate traffic as an example. Um, but we, you know, we're also a believer that the way the security market is headed is not positive. You know, basically what's <laughs> happening, it, you know, basically what's happening is collect more and more data. Right. Um, buy bigger and bigger computers to do more analysis that is going to increase the amount of investigations that are required and decrease the percentage for remediations. Our role is actually the opposite. We're trying to reduce the amount of data yep. that is collected from an alert perspective by blocking these tactics and enable a much higher percentage of incident investigation to occur and therefore a much higher percentage of remediation to occur. You know, as you're saying that, that makes a lot of sense to me because I'm, I'm kind of looking at it as, you know, 20 years ago, we'd look at it and say, man, I wish I could analyze all this data. But that's lazy, right? Because it meant we weren't able to define what we expected on the network or what, what was typical. And so we kind of threw our hands up. Now we have all that processing power and we go, oh, look at all the stuff we can do. And you're saying, sure, but that's just going to create an extra lot of work, right? It's a cyclical problem. And otherwise, you could look at it and go, hey, what if we simplified? What, what if we defined what we expected to happen? And I would even argue all that processing power makes it possible. I don't have one device now that has to do 15 different things. I can have purpose-built devices, most of them virtual anyway. So, it, okay, that's that's an interesting... When you go and you pitch that, is that part of your value prop? It's about simplifying and, and clarifying? And how are people responding to that? It is definitely part of our value prop. What we don't have is enough data to prove it yet. You know, I mean, we're, we're in yeah. the mode of of collecting more data. We have some advisors actually doing analytics to see if they can prove the point. We know it's true, but the problem is you have to collect enough data and do enough analysis to make people really believe your hypothesis. Uh, but we're definitely headed that direction. And conceptually, everyone agrees this is the right direction from a data flow perspective. I, I can tell you, I mean, it, it's elegant. It makes sense to me. Like, I, I, I like it on a lot of levels. So who are, who are you targeting? I mean, you, you came out of the Beltway area. Uh, we know that's a hot spot for security technologies that also have an appeal toward a number of government uh, types of agencies. But you've also talked about commercializing it. So are you finding traction in the mid-market? Are you looking at enterprises? Have you found an industry? Or wh where are you at in that life cycle of, of kind of getting it fired up and running fast? Oh, sure. We're, we're focusing on the mid-market first. So we're That's going right. after organizations 500 to 1,000 users or less, uh, building the platform in those organizations, proving the, you know, the, the points that I brought up, and then we'll eventually go after the larger enterprises. The value proposition is really to anyone who takes cybersecurity seriously. If, if you are holding financial data, healthcare data, and if you lose that data, you're going to be fined. It, it's a big cost to your organization. Um, if you lose data, your stock price can go down. Uh, if you lose government data, you potentially create yeah. a, a, a risk for a, a, a nation state. These are all organizations that find it very important. One area that we're not broaching into quite yet, but I think it is an important area, it is going to be um, a critical infrastructure. And the reason why we're taking our time to go into that sector is critical infrastructure is built on a whole different paradigm. Oh, yeah. It isn't, it isn't about just attacks. It's about uptime. So you have to have a proven track record in your uptime. No, that makes sense. I also think, too, I, I mean, if you don't mind the commentary, I think it's smart to go after mid-market. They're, they're big enough to know they have a problem, but they're small enough to not have the complexity that the large enterprises have, which is going to give you the chance to get in a little simpler. It's going to be probably for them a lower price point, and hopefully they'll see the value quicker. Um, I, I will not grill you with my normal le level of questions around value, but typically when do you see people realize that initial return on their investment? couple months uh, within the first year, how long till they come back and call you up and say, Mike, I am so glad we said yes. Well, with the people that we're selling to, they actually see the return on investment almost immediately. That's and the awesome. reason, And the reason they see it is that, you know, we're stopping these attacks that they were getting so they can see an immediate reduction in the attack surface that's taking place. 
So now that you've been in the business of uh, raising funds and building a team and explaining stuff into the marketplace, uh, looking dashing on camera. I mean, this stuff can't be easy. <laughs> w- when you look at, at the, the rest of the industry, what are the things that get you excited? So a lot of the people watching this, right, we, we have people that invest in programs uh, and, and companies like yours. We have the buyers, the people in the mid-market and the SMB and the enterprises that are learning about these technologies, as well as we talk about leadership, right, and the whole business of security. And then we have people sitting there that are other founders or they're interested in maybe starting their own. Now that you've been through some of that grind, any big lessons to reflect on? Somebody else, you know, I'll say sitting at home, I don't know, maybe in traffic, but kind of what would you tell somebody else who's thinking about embarking on their own startup journey and or working with a startup in the enterprise? Sure. This is actually my third startup. The first two were built, you know, several (laughs) years ago. So it's something that I know pretty well. And I, you know, it really starts with a team and a culture. You have to build a phenomenal team of great minds, but also minds that can interact with each other really well. Um, You then go to a board of directors, a board of advisors. That has to fit the culture um, just as well as the employees. Um, And that to me is really critical because what you find in a startup is the best laid plans that you enter into aren't the plans that you have a year or two. (laughs) a year or two years into it. So you have to be prepared for pivoting. If you're not prepared for that, then your employees aren't prepared for it and you're going to get culture shock and potentially go under because you're not ready for it. So how, just curious, how do you prepare for a pivot or how do you prepare people? I mean, is it as simple as to say at some point we're going to pivot and hold on? No, you, you take the mindset of always listening, right? So you know, you go out and talk to prospective clients, you talk to uh, industry analysts, uh, have the conversations we're having today, you get feedback, and then you sit down with your team and say, what's our roadmap? What should we do? What feedback should we validate? What feedback should we believe? Um, where should we go? And it's always a constant interaction and dialogue. And so pivoting becomes really easy if you're collecting this data and making decisions in, uh, based on the data. I like that. I like that a lot. If you were going to start a, another company, I know you're busy right now. What what part of the space excites you in addition to what you're doing? Um, I, I would say this whole authentication space, you know, how mm. authentic, authenticating users. Um, I, I think there's a lot of different angles to it, but I think that is, you know, we interact with authentication, but that is going to be one of the key spaces for IoT devices uh, because they're just so wide open and accessible to everybody. Interesting while we're on the subject, and as you said, Mike, there are a lot of different angles. When I look at the common uh, weaknesses and exposures in organizations that often lead to compromise, many of them, while missing patches is a thing, don't get me wrong, many of them stem from authentication and specifically in Windows Active Directory. And I think I agree with you. There are a lot of exciting things that are happening in authentication. However, because Windows has such a legacy in the enterprise and we have to support all these devices, they all treated authentication for different services differently. And to make things work, they're very, tried to be very helpful to get people to authenticate. And that's like one of the number one things that attackers <laughs> prey on in people's networks today. So if we're going to solve some problems with authentication, I think that's one area uh, we need to focus on. I also think the IoT in authentication is very interesting as well. Right. And you can actually make a corollary between an IoT device and a medical device. Mm. You know, both are very difficult to protect. You're not going to be putting... Um, you know, antivirus software on them. You're not going to be protecting them in a traditional way. So I think we have to start thinking about devices as a category, whether it's an IoT or it's a, uh, you know, an MRI machine, because they're all, they're all extremely important devices to protect. And you're almost saying then think of it as a device, not just as a, a categorical endpoint, but like we've almost okay. got to rethink it. Yes. Well, and, and so many of those medical devices are running Windows, older Windows operating systems, and that has presented a huge problem uh, for the healthcare community. Josh Corman gave a, a great keynote at Source Boston the other day, and uh, him and I were talking about that after the fact, and it's, it's a very difficult problem 
to solve. And I think we'll see some type of regulation, but I, I also think that we can make some great strides on the network and in software to improve uh, basically the authentication, like who should connect to that device. And yeah. I think a lot of times you find flat networking, and I think, you know, that's part of what your solution, I think we talked about, Mike, as well. And I think it's really important to, to have those options, especially in healthcare, because I don't think many of us have really thought about how catastrophic it is, right, to have these devices and have them be offline. An x-ray machine being offline means patients need to be diverted. And so these problems are, are very significant. Yeah, or let's go ahead and change some metrics in that x-ray machine so the data is now not accurate. Yeah, that would be. Yep. So it, does, it doesn't have to be offline. You know, that's part of what our value proposition is too. Because we're obfuscating the network, we're making it unable or an, unable for a hacker or a malicious insider to actually figure out where those devices are and their vulnerabilities. The vulnerabilities are invisible on a network protected with Kryptonite NXT. Yeah, and what I like about this too is I, I deal a lot in friction. So you're essentially increasing friction for an attacker. And unless they are highly determined to go after that specific client for some acts that they've got to grind, but if they're more opportunistic, they're done. They're just going to move on. No, no interest in wasting their time on that. Absolutely. I personally always love it when we can frustrate attackers. Yes. <laughs> like I, just, I, take, I take pleasure in that. I always think it's fantastic. Mike, it's been a fun conversation. Thank you very much uh, for sharing a lot of your expertise. Yeah, no, it's been fun for me, too. I appreciate the time, guys. Thanks so much, Mike. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and continue our discussion here on Startup Security Weekly. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. 